Hi, I'm Angie Beeman, and welcome to Totally Clutch. This is the podcast for women like you to find ways to simplify your business and personal life. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted. All right, welcome back to another episode of Totally Clutch. This is the Clutch Businesses podcast and vlog, and I'm Angie Veeman, your host. And today we're going to be talking about, well, honestly, I think we're going to end up talking about a lot of different things because our guest, Rihanna Campbell, is... She, she covers a lot of like a wide spectrum of expertise. So she has an extensive and impressive real estate background. She's now using that. So she's built incredible businesses and she's now using um, her, her background, her experience, all of that to help other businesses uh, make sure that they're profitable and successful and all of those types of things. So we've got, I think we're going to, we're going to end up talking about a lot of different things, but the, the reason that we came together was to really talk about, um, you know, you hear a lot about how, how hard it is to start a business. And, you know, obviously there is information out there about how to sustain a business, but with 50% of small businesses closing after five years, I feel like it's a worthy conversation to talk about how, how to sustain it, how to build a lifelong business. And in order to do that, you have to make sure that you're profitable, right? So you have to be making money in order to keep going. And that's really where Rihanna comes in. So she works with small businesses. She works with executives. She works with all, with all kinds of business owners to navigate the challenges of growing a profitable business. And so we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about that with her today and hear all that she has to say. So welcome to the show, Rihanna. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about our conversation today. Yeah, me too. I, and like I said, I feel like we're going to end up talking about a lot of different stuff. But yeah. <laughs> why don't you tell us first about your background, about you, about the work that you're doing? Yeah, sure. So I have been in the real estate industry for over 17 years now, um, since actually uh, 2004. So when the market was super crazy, um, right before the crash happened is when I got started. Um, and I've been uh, doing uh, growing my real estate business and for I guess 10 years after that and um, built it up to very successful levels. So I got it to multi-million dollar levels and sold it a few years ago. And after selling it, decided that I was going to use um, my experience and my expertise and my knowledge to help other business owners. So I've been working with a lot of real estate um, business owners, um, specifically on the property management side, but also real estate agents and real estate investors, helping them grow their business. Um, and just last year with COVID hitting, uh, a lot of people were impacted, especially their jobs were impacted. And so I've been working with a number of small business owners, people who lost their jobs, who wanted to take their side hustle into like a legitimate business. Um, and also um, folks who just wanted to transition from either like working for an agency to um, working on their own. Um, and so I've just been helping people as much as I can, especially in the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's kind of all. <laughs> we all are just trying to do everything that we can to to help ourselves out, to help each other out, right? Like this is such an interesting time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you for for doing that. And and you know, you're in such an incredible industry, and it's amazing. It, I mean, we were talking about this before that you know, there's so much even though it seems like different industries are so different from one another, there's so much on, on the business side of things that can be learned across industries. And so, you know, building, building a business to the, you know, to the height that you did, you definitely have some, um, some experience and insight to share with people. That's awesome. Yeah, I do have a, a very operational perspective of, you know, how to, um, kind of build and grow a business and, and what that looks like and what it takes to do. I think um, the challenge for a lot of small business owners is that they know how to do the technical work. Um, so like a hairstylist knows how to style hair, but doesn't necessarily know how to run a hair salon. Um, and so I help people to close the gap of their knowledge and, and really try to figure out what they need to do um, and what they need to implement in order for them to have success. 
Yeah. So is that where most of them kind of not go wrong, but when you're thinking about uh, building a sustainable and a profitable business, which is what you focus on with them, is that where, where you see kind of most of the issues breeding is that they're stuck in, in this doing mode instead of this leadership mode? That's definitely one of the biggest mistakes that I see. Um, and I, I can't really call that a mistake, but that's one of the biggest problems that I see in, in really um, people trying to achieve success. They struggle with really trying to move from that um, business operator to business investor. Um, you know, people like I, I had went to a conference this weekend um, and listened to Tony Robbins and Folks like him, you you hear him talk, and he owns hundreds of businesses. Um, how would that be possible? Well, he can't be involved in hundreds of businesses. And so, um, what do we as individual kind of solopreneurs need to do to get um, to shift from working in the business all the time to really um, building an investment for ourselves and our family? Um, and so, that's I think one of the biggest issues that people struggle with um because they don't know exactly what it takes to take that leap yeah what does it take to take that leap i mean <laughs> is it just shifting your mindset and shifting the things that you're focusing on and what you're looking at or yeah so there are a number of mistakes okay so that was one mistake one one mistake or um issue that i noticed that people have one of the other ones is not having a very clear vision of what they want um mm -hmm. You know, I think that there are people who are in it for the money, but they're not in it for the passion or they're not in it for the interest. And I think um, as a business owner or, or trying to be entrepreneur, you just need to figure out what you stand for. Um, so what are you trying to do? Um, because the vision is really what's going to get you to the next level. Um, another mistake that I see is people aren't very clear with the people who are helping them, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's their staff or you know, virtual assistants or um, people they partner with, they're not clear what they stand for. They're not very clear about the vision um, of what they're trying to build. Um, they give out tasks, but don't allow people to really support them into building out that vision. And so, you know, you have resources and access to so much technology now. Um, and you, it's really being able to fully utilize that, that I think is really important for us. Um, so really being clear with the people who are there to support you, team members, staff, whoever, whoever they are. Um, another big mistake I see is uh, not really fully utilizing like the resources that people have out there, whether that's um, money or grants or the like SBA loans. People were getting SBA loans uh, during COVID and they dropped so many restrictions and people had access to funds that they wouldn't have normally had access to as easily as they did. So some people took advantage of that and some people didn't. Um, and if you didn't, why not? I think that, you know, the government allows people to grow businesses because businesses build economies and they're trying to build the economy back up and they're trying to really make improvements to what's going on. Um, and small businesses are one of the biggest employers when you look at you know the employment rate, most of that goes down because of small businesses, and most of it goes up because of small businesses. So, how can you use your business to help other people, and what does that look like? Yeah, so, that's amazing. Again, that's mm -hmm. I want to just touch on something that you kind of want to, I guess, add to what you were saying because so we're in a recession. Well, actually, I don't know if like right now we're in a recession, but we were in a recession. You know starting a year and a half ago, basically. And that tends to be a time when so many businesses, um, so many businesses are started, so many businesses are founded, small businesses. And, you know, I use that stat at the beginning of, you know, 50% of small businesses close after five years. And one of the main reasons is capital, right? So they don't have enough, they don't have enough money to um, to grow and, and sustain what, what they've built. And so what you're saying about, so, you know, in times like this, right, so recession-ish times, there are a lot of resources available to small businesses. And so I love that, I love that you brought that up because why not go after them right now and start to, and start to hedge your bets against, you know, falling over the edge in five years, right? Like, 
take take what you can now. Yeah, one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever gotten in business is borrow when you don't need it so that you have it when you need it. Because yeah. when you need it, you can't get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's almost guaranteed when you need to have the money, um, it's really challenging to get access to it. And it's so much harder to get. Um, but when it when you do take the time to get it, even though you don't need it, this isn't something that you have to use right away. Um, there are no restrictions, usually for the most part, there are no restrictions in how you use that money and when you use that money. Um, obviously you have to pay it back if it's a loan, but if it's a grant, you can take that money and you know put it in the savings account and just hang on to it until you need it. But yeah. I think it really makes sense to um, take advantage of, uh, whatever resources are out there for you. People are still doing a lot of grants and um, a lot of small business support. Just get access to some of those um, uh, providers that give you that information, that feed you that information. A lot of um, state-specific uh, business administrative um, uh, support groups and networks and things like that. They have access to all of those resources and can tell you like what grants are available and have regular emails that come out to help support small businesses. So, you know, get on those email lists so that you can get that information um, because it's there. I mean, it's there and people want to give away that money. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's what it's allocated for, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, good. Okay, super helpful. Um, so one of the things, one of the other things that you talk about oftentimes too is that uh, overcomplicated rarely gets it done. So what does, like, how do people usually overcomplicate things? How do businesses usually overcomplicate things? I think we naturally, I, I don't know if this is like a human trait, we naturally just want to overcomplicate it. Um, things are a lot simpler than they have, than I think we make them out to be. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really just about breaking things down into small tasks. So the business that people like to use as a great example is like McDonald's, you know, you get um, one person to do very small pieces of the task and you get another person to do very small pieces of the task. So you have the burger flipper, you have the French fry maker. There are ways that you can build out your business to be just that. There's also technology that you can use to automate a lot of things. So for example, you know, if you are um, a type of person who needs to get uh, things calendared and you have clients that you work with who want to schedule appointments with you, instead of you manually putting that into your calendar, your Google calendar, they have scheduling tools that you can get pretty much for free. Um, and you can use those, those tools to help you keep things organized. And so, you know, utilizing technology and, and finding ways that you can make things automated is going to help you a lot down the line. Um, so finding little things like that will help to really uncomplicate and untangle different aspects of your business. Um, there's so many other pieces of technology out there, honestly, that people can use to just make their lives a lot easier. But I think we we think it's complicated um, when really and truly it might be five steps that we just need to get really clear what we need to do. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think another way too to, to tie back to something else that you were saying before, I think another way that I see people overcomplicate their business is by switching gears a lot, right? Like, and, and you know, trust me, <laughs> I understand the importance of, of a pivot after this, you know, the last year and a half. But I also think that there's, you know, what you were saying is that a lot of, a lot of people aren't clear on, on what they're, you know, they know what they're doing on a day to day basis, but they're not clear on a strategy or on a, on a vision for what they're creating. And I think that lack of clarity you know, it, it trickles down to their interactions with the people that they've, you know, the team that they have to support them. But it also, I think it trickles down or it starts to look like, you know, the, if they're switching strategies, if they're switching directions really frequently, it's really hard to do things well then. And, and it just gets overcomplicated. So you're redoing things over and over and over again, and you're never really fully seeing anything to the finish line because you, for whatever reason, I mean, we could talk about mindset, we could talk about, you know, all types of reasons why 
you know, you never fully live out the, the strategy that you've put in place. But I think that's one place that I see a lot of businesses get really messy because they, it's just like constantly switching gears. Nobody knows where they're at. And, um, and it's really hard to invest in that. Yeah, when you just when you're first getting started, um, I think that it can be really challenging because you kind of have to be adaptive in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the problem is that, uh, you know, without that clear vision, you don't have that why that you're aiming for. Um, I think, you know, you may not know how you're going to get there, but you need to know where you're going, right? So you need to have that final destination in mind. So just thinking about like, okay, I'm going to use a GPS. I know the location of where I am right now, and I know the location of where I'm going. Those two pieces are the most important pieces to have. Everything else in between, you're, it's not going to be a straight road. There's not going to be a straight line to get there. Um, it's going to be a lot of curves and turns and twists, and you're going to have to change things up. And one tactic you use today may not be the one you use later on. Um, what I like to tell people is to take five tasks that you can do for a period of time, try it out, um, do it for, let's say a year, um, and really try and see if it's going to work for you. So I call it, uh, for me, I call it my power five, right? So for example, in my coaching business, um, I uh, do a lot of speaking. So there's um, speaking events and things that I go to. So that's on my power five list. Um, another one is um, podcast interviews. So like this one, um, this is one of the things that I do. So um, I have that on my list of, of, of tactics that I'm going to use. Um, another one is I keep um, my email list engaged by sending out a weekly newsletter. So I send out a newsletter every week and keep everyone in the loop of what's going on and give them advice and help them grow their business with small snippets of information. Um, another one is social media engagement. So just making sure that I'm creating some social media content, I'm engaging with my audience there, um, connecting with friends, connecting with uh, kind of my target audience. Um, so that's uh, kind of one thing that I'm doing. So and my last one is, I have to improve my follow up game. So making sure that I'm following up with people who come to me and say they need some help, but they're not ready to buy now. So making sure that I keep them in the loop of what's going on and just making sure that I'm there for them when they're ready to go. Um, so that's my power five. And this is kind of something that's very um, easy for you to implement in your business. But the idea of having the power five is that you need to do it consistently over a period of time. So you have to do it consistently for say six months to a year. Um, and by doing that, you give yourself that um, uh, thing that you need to have done and you're working on and you're working towards. And it's not something that you should easily be changing. So mm -hmm. um, every six months you're evaluating, okay, is this still gonna be my power five? Is this still like the top thing that I need to be focusing my attention on? Um, at some point in time, you may need to swap one out or swap one um, in, but for the most part, you're not changing all five things that you're doing. You're not trying new things every month. You're sticking with five things because you're not going to see the result of your actions if you don't consistently do it over time. Um, so that's part of, I think, the biggest problem that you're kind of mentioning that people keep changing directions and trying new things and, and, and the people who work for you or working with you or supporting you, they're not sure exactly what your vision is anymore because they're not sure what you're aiming at. So making sure that your why never changes, how you get there changes, but not every day, <laughs> not all the time. Yeah, that's a, such a great way to think about it. It's so, that's really helpful. And the other thing that I love that you, you know, that you were kind of addressing too, is that if, you never get any data like you can't really so if you never if you don't really dedicate a certain amount of time to something to you know to trying it out to to testing it out to you know seeing how it feels for you there's no data points so you don't there's no way for you to learn and grow from that really to see okay so this didn't work um because you don't even know if it if it worked or not right yeah, I, I think people have that same, um, like, say, for example, um, you're trying out Facebook advertising, and you put an ad out, and you're not getting any hits. And you're just like, Oh, it's been a couple days, it's not working. Like, how would you know, it's gonna work, you need yeah. to give it time, it, you need to have time is what is 
um, the deciding factor for what's working and that's what's not working. If you're not giving things enough time, then how do you know it's not going to work? Um, so having things um, go for a certain period of time and starting to see, you start to see signs that you're getting some traction. You don't see nothing. <laughs> you should never see yeah. nothing. You do start to see that there are some signs that this thing can be working, but you just have to stick with it. And that's really what's going to get you to that to that goal that you're looking for. Yeah, that's great. And then what is, okay, so we've got our power five, we're simplifying things. Like what does life look like on the other side of that? When we've got this amazing practice in place, we're doing it regularly, we're all about simplification. What, is, what can we expect to see? Well, the life that I have seen that a lot of people want, right? What people talk about all the time is they're doing this because they want some type of freedom. They want freedom from a job. Um, they no longer want to work their nine to five. They want freedom from the day-to-day -day nuances of things. Um, so at that point, it's time to switch gears, right? So one of the things I mentioned earlier is switching from being the operator to being the investor. Um, and that takes a mindset shift. So you need to start learning and growing and understanding your business and understanding business in general and what you need to do to shift from where you are right now to where you want to go. Um, and then once you make that shift, then you can start changing your focus and doing the things that you want to do in life. Um, spending more time with your family, whether you have young kids, whether you have um, aging parents, whether you have other passions that you want to start paying attention to. Um, I think one of the goals for building the business is to get what the freedom that we want from it and then be able to focus on the things that matter. Um, so my goal for you is if you are really trying to work this business and you're spending time in it and you're growing it and it's starting to look like it's working, get it to a place where it's automated and you have the technology working, you have the support team and you've gotten to the point where you can step away without it breaking and falling apart and then get to a place where you feel comfortable um, spending more time focusing on the things that matter and less time working in the business. Yeah, that's great. That's, I mean, I, that is what we, we all aspire to, right? It's yeah. a bit of a leap. It's a little bit of oh a leap. Oh my gosh, it feels so uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, most but it also feels really good. It, yeah, it right? Like they just think it's supposed to be hard. Yeah. And I, so one of the things that I learned, especially as being a coach is I am the bridge for you to go from where you are to go to where you want to be. Um, I've been through it. I went through all the twists and turns and I, I did all of the things. So finding someone who can help bridge the gap for you and tell you exactly what you need to do to get from where you are right now to where you want to be is really what's going to help you to make that transition over as easy as possible. Otherwise, you're just figuring it out on your own. So, you know, don't hesitate to pay for help, to pay for people, to give you the guidance you need to cut down the time it's going to take you to get from where you are right now to where you want to be. Yeah, that's that's a great thing for us all to keep in mind. And investing in help, right? Investing in a team is really scary. But, you know, when you start to calculate the the potential that you're losing by doing it yourself, it's... Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to see. It is. It is. But, you know, there are skills that we have to pick up when we're entrepreneurs. Um, one of the most important ones is communication. So how do you communicate with others? What do you say to them? How do you speak to them? How do you listen to them? Um, whether they're your client or whether they are your employee um, or whether they're someone who is a 1099 employee and you're paying or whether it's a virtual assistant living in a completely different country. Um, whatever it is, communication is so important. So figuring out how you can be um, a really good communicator is, is really important. Um, one of the things that I learned is um, uh, when you're an entrepreneur, especially in a role of leadership, you want to be a direct communicator. So when you're communicating out to other people, you be as direct as possible. So you know, instead of using the term, instead of saying something like, oh, I'm really thirsty and expecting someone to get you a glass of water, ask someone to get you a glass of water. Say, I'm really thirsty. I'd really like you to get me a glass of water. So being very direct is important when you're working with other people. But the other side of that is being an indirect listener. 
So when you're in a role of, when you're in a leadership role, people aren't going to be as direct with you. They're going to be kind of indirect. So you have to listen for indirect cues. Um, and that could be kind of what I said before, which is someone saying, oh, I'm really thirsty. And now you have the opportunity to be um, to act on the indirect listening that you did. So you can get someone a glass of water. So don't expect everyone to be direct towards you, but you have to be direct towards them when you're communicating what your needs are. Um, and then you also have to be an indirect listener. So you're listening to what they're saying to you and you're interpreting it in a way that um, you can help support them and what they're trying to do. Yeah, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's the last thing that you think about as an entrepreneur. You're focused on revenue and and paying people and you know all of those types of things, not necessarily on how you're communicating. And it's huge. It's very big. It's a very big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can we switch it? So we are, you know, we're running out of time. I said this before. I feel like we could talk forever. Um, <laughs> but before we go, I want to, I just am super curious if anybody, so you've got this rich background in real estate and such a deep understanding of the industry and, and, you know, what, where it's been, where it's going, where it is right now. Um, what, what, can you tell people or what should people be keeping in mind if they are interested in entering into real estate and, and how can they enter into it? I mean, there's so many different, I imagine there's so many different ways that they can, they can do that. Yeah. So real estate is a great um, investment. Um, and in my opinion, <laughs> it's one of the things that, um, that I love to invest in. Um, but just like any other investment, you have to first figure out what kind of investor are you? So are you the Warren Buffett that you, you know, are investing in something for a long term gain that you're probably going to keep forever and transition to your, your kids or your grandkids later on down the line? Or are you kind of that options person where you're flipping and trying to get the a, a fast buck really fast, um, double your money in, in 30 days? Are you that type of investor? So figure out what type of investor you are um, and figure out where you land. And depending on where you land, um, then you have to figure out whether real estate is a good investment for you. So, you know, it's great to purchase properties and, um, and be a landlord and have tenants in those properties. Um, but you're not going to necessarily get a quick turnaround. Sometimes you do. So markets like this, people take advantage of the time where they bought at the beginning of the uh, pandemic and they're selling at the end of the pandemic and they're making a huge killing. Um, and then there are people who own property for years who couldn't get uh, $10,000 more for their property who now have an opportunity to sell for like $200,000 more than what they bought it for. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of um, opportunity to make money on your investment, but try to figure out what kind of investor you are so you know when it makes sense to sell. Now, it doesn't always make sense to sell at certain times, just depending on what you want to do. So for example, there are people who are selling right now who are thinking that they're going to take all this money and um, invest it into the market again later. Um, but that may not necessarily be true. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen to the market later on down the line. Uh, people are expecting this bubble to burst and then they're going to buy low, but that may not happen. Um, or it might be more challenging. Um, there might be more players with deeper pockets in the market uh, that make it really hard for you to buy. So you just never know what's going to happen. So figure out, again, if you know what kind of investor you are, you might want to keep real estate for 10 years or 20 years. Um, and so if that's your game plan, stick to that game plan. Know exactly what you want to do with that property. And regardless of what's going on in the market and regardless of you know, whether there's highs or lows or whatever, don't try to predict what's going to happen in the future. Stick to your plan and try and figure out what's going to make the most sense for your family. Um, and, you know, just like any other investment that you would buy. So just kind of keep that in mind. That's great. Thank you for that. And I mean, I, in, in times like this, you know, I think there's I don't, I don't, I don't think we're in a state of panic necessarily, but I think, you know, there's a heightened, um, I don't know. People are just a little freaked out and and thinking about things a little differently than than they normally do. And so that's such a good reminder. Again, you know, so we're talking about it in business in general, but now it's coming up again in real estate. Like, again, just stick to the plan, create, you know, create your vision, 
and and play that out and and see and see what happens and and reap the benefits of it. Yeah, and pay for the advice that you need. Um, you know, I think some people want to manage property themselves, but you get a lot of knowledge and experience and expertise when you pay a property manager. Um, and it, sometimes it's not worth saving $100. Sometimes it's yeah. worth it for you to spend the money to hire a professional who knows all the laws and, um, and are on top of things, especially when it comes to things going on right now on the property management side and the eviction moratorium. And, you know, you need someone to bat for you. Um, so it's worthwhile to pay someone to be that in advisor for this investment because it's a very expensive investment. So yeah. um, if you're going to plan to invest in real estate, make sure you have the right team for it. Great. Yeah. OK. And speaking of that, so if people are interested in, in working with you and finding out more about uh, about your work and and working with you directly, how can they do that? Yeah, so I'm on all the social medias. Um, you can find me at Rihanna M. Campbell, um, or you can send me an email to Rihanna at properplanning.realestate. Um, if you find me on the socials and you want to send me a DM, feel free. Um, I have a ton of free content and information that I'm happy to share with you, including ways that you can kind of transition from uh, being a business operator to being a business investor and, and how you can do that in five simple steps. So if you want that information, you can grab that from me as well. Cool. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here today. I mean, this was, it was so helpful and, and it was, it was actually so nice and refreshing to talk about kind of the long game in business and not just you know, starting out, getting this stuff set up and all of that kind of stuff. So thank you for the work that you do. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And yeah, um, yeah thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun. Awesome. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted. Rate and review this podcast and share it with all of your friends. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you're leaving with some great things that can help you move from hustle to flow because I believe in you and your business. Until next time.